Over the last five months, I've interviewed many notable names, TV icons, celebrities, journalists, and the current Miss Ireland. But the biggest name and the biggest reaction, and in fact the most viewed, was the local parish priest, Father Shane. How are things? Things are good, Jack. Thanks very much. (laughs) Wow. I beat Miss Ireland? You did. In fact, by numbers, you beat Miss Ireland. Wow. I I think that says something about your viewers. I'm not sure what... (laughs) That seems very strange. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, how how has life been over the last five months? When I last spoke to you, uh, we we hadn't gone into the to, 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 to the third lockdown. We weren't sure about it, but things were starting to look up. If only we knew. Yeah, that's exactly that's right. If only we knew it was right. No, thankfully now again things seem to be getting better. You know, mm. and I think uh, we're all we're all very grateful for that. To, you know, it seems that it's. Uh, people's spirits have definitely been lifted the last couple of weeks. Mm, mm. But in terms of yourself, your role as a priest and within the community, what's that been like over the last five months? Of course, you couldn't really have people in the church or, or very limited. So how have you had to how have you have to adapt to those situations? Yeah, um, it's it's been great having people back at mass. Thank God. Uh, just to see yeah, to see people back in the church and able to receive the sacraments, it's, um, it's essential for the believer. I mean, it's, you know, for someone who doesn't believe it might be, it might seem like just another kind of community event, something that's, you know, enjoyable and a social outlet or whatever, but there's a spiritual dimension to the believer where this is, I mean, it's, it is really essential for us. Um, and I saw people really suffer not having access to the sacraments. So it does my heart good to see people back there. And I'm, uh, and it's, it's wonderful to be a part of such a, a vibrant parish where, I mean, like we, the, the church is full, you know, we've, mm. and we have overflow sometimes as well. So we have people, you know, waiting outside as well for mass to finish so that they come in and receive Holy communion. Mm. So, um, it's nice. It's nice mm. to see people back and mm. yeah, I, definitely lifts my spirits that's Mm. for sure you know i remember i think it must have been 2012 or 2013 when they started kind of messing around with webcams and all that stuff and i think they never someone must have had an you know an intuition and then nothing really came of it of course in the last while that's really been the only method of delivering mass to most of the people out there is it different delivering it to kind of an empty church and basically delivering it to a webcam instead of parishioners it's so weird. Absolutely. Yeah. You, I mean, you're, you're sort of, you're, you're talking there to a bunch of empty seats. Uh, you feel like you're talking to yourself. Yeah. You're very self-conscious. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's very, it was very weird. You, it's funny. You do get used to it, but uh, it's great to see people back in there now. Mm. Um, even if, even if for nothing else, those uh, subtle and not so subtle, sometimes visual cues that you need to wrap it up. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's mm. none of those when you don't have when you just have the seats. You can just talk until mm. I don't know. You kind of uh, are exhausted. Mm. Well, people let you know in in sometimes not so subtle ways. Mm. I re- I remember last time you gave us an idea as to how you put together mass and this kind of system you had developed. Has that been altered when you don't necessarily have the, the visual cues you were speaking of? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it definitely it definitely was. I mean, I. I I, I know myself just the amount of time typically that, you know, you, you want to keep your homilies. I mean, certainly less than 10 minutes, you know, I, you're, you're talking about, I don't know, maybe somewhere between five and eight minutes, I think is the ideal, which, you know, is the ideal. And I'm not always great at kind of hitting in that mark, but um, it's fairly decent as far as people's attention span is concerned. So you kind of know it yourself, but it is helpful to like when you're talking to someone, uh, you're talking. You're trying to communicate with people. It's really helpful to make eye contact with them to see if they're with you. And you know, when you don't have people in front of you, it's hard to know if you're really connecting at all. Mm. If they're, um, if they're really like taking in what you're saying and if it's resonating with them. Mm. So when you when you are talking to people uh, in a church, you know, yeah, you, you learn to to see. You know, are they really with you or are they kind of tuned out? Mm. Over the last five months, has your own faith been challenged by this whole ordeal? Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, not really, to be honest with you. Uh, like I, 
I think it's been. I think it's been. Has my own faith been challenged? Uh, not not terribly, to be honest with you. And I, I would like to say that it was like a, a real season of growth as well. But it's been quite busy for us, to be honest with you, man. Like mm. we're thankfully we're able. To, we have the hospital here, and so we've been able to be in the hospital for uh, the entirety of the time. So we were kept quite busy there, especially when people were quite sick with COVID. Mm. Um, we were in the hospital quite a bit now, thankfully really since February, the numbers have dropped off substantially. Mm. So that, that was, that was good. Yeah. So to be honest with you, we really didn't have, thankfully in, in the, in a town, the size of castle bar, much of a lull. Mm. So it hasn't been, I suppose my duties have changed somewhat or had changed somewhat. But uh, it wasn't as though I was I was sitting around and, you know, uh, it wasn't a time of real crisis or introversion or anything. Mm. We still had our work to do. Mm. So that's just being honest. It, it wasn't a huge uh, kind of m- moment where my faith was challenged. No. OK. The bedside calls. Very, very interesting. What is it like when you speak to, say, myself or somebody who isn't in particular immediate need or isn't facing perhaps the end of their life versus somebody who is? Yeah, uh, it is. Yeah, you kind of when, when I'm talking to someone who's healthy and well, um, you know, generally you're just it's very ordinary, you know, so mm. I get to know people and uh, build friendships, build relationships. And then within the context of like that friendship or relationship, um, you know, people will often kind of ask questions or, you know, I'll be able to give them some encouragement or maybe some some guidance is just guidance in the sense of like helping them to connect with God, mm. especially as far as someone in the hospital is concerned, you know, your time with them is much shorter. Mm. So it's not like you have the the luxury of getting to know them and, you know, like a long uh, kind of a, an established friendship. Uh, but you're just have this this very intense moment with them uh, where you pray with them. Uh, you maybe maybe there are some questions. Uh, but very often you're you're celebrating the sacraments and you're giving them God's forgiveness. Mm. Uh, you're preparing them. Often it's preparing them for death mm. to stand before God. You know, that moment that we'll all face one day. Mm. So, yeah, it's very different. Mm. But uh, very, I'd say very ordinary when I'm talking to like yourself or just kind of people who are, thank God, healthy and well. Mm. Certainly, it's a, it's a position that I'm sure not many people would like to find themselves in. Your own faith. No. We, we spoke a little of it and we kind of gave an overview as to how you went from a little of a rebel. Your rebellious phase, I believe, was loitering in a church uh, in between periods of school. So it wasn't, you know, you weren't burning down churches or anything, but certainly a question of faith. <laughs> no. Well, Jack, I, I, I definitely, uh, I didn't tell you the, I didn't tell you the sort of like gory details. Believe me, my, the worst I was, if the worst I had done was loiter in a church. Yeah, you're right. That would be. <laughs> That would be pretty tame to be, you know, uh, PG rated. But no, I, I was a little bit more than that. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely I've definitely had a God has definitely come into my life, you know, mm. since, since the time I was uh, in secondary school, about 18, that that big change kind of happened for me. Mm. Well, it started to happen. My my big question, I wondered, was why Christianity? Why C- Catholicism, I suppose, specifically? Why this sect? Why this sect of God? And why not, you know, um, the Islam faiths or any of the Buddhism, any of the others? What what do you find in Catholicism that is particularly unique? Mm. Oh, very good. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I mean, the so initially... Like it wasn't as though I was sort of like uh, on this path to where I was exploring all these different religions and picking amongst mm. all of them. I was I was born Catholic and I was kind of raised within that tradition. So initially it was, you know, I was connecting with God within, you know, like as a, as my parents had sort of taught me, you know, and as you know, this priest, I think I mentioned this priest to you, Mm. you know, as he was able to kind of like guide us as well. So it was within the kind of Catholic, um, 
within the Catholic tradition and uh, sort of like being fed kind of like the truths of Christianity and the Catholic faith. Mm. Um, but the more I learned, uh, the more compelling I found it, let's say, mm. you know, so I, I actually got a chance to sort of learn, well, why do we believe some of the things that we believe? And do we have justification for believing those things? Or is it just some opinion that someone had once and now a whole bunch of people have kind of bought into? So um, I suppose, I mean, like the, the, some of the most compelling things about the, the, about Catholicism are the, the person of Jesus Christ uh, and the claims made about him, you know, that he is not just a, another moral teacher like the Buddha uh, and not just sort of a, you know, some sort of a, a, a dynamic figure or a revolutionary figure uh, like the likes of which we would have seen maybe in, you know, particularly the 20th century, some of the revolutionary movements, but that he was in fact God. And the, I suppose the, uh, the dramatic testimony of those immediately in his immediate circle and those who followed him, that he rose from the dead mm. and uh, their willingness to like, uh, to hold to that truth that, that they saw him risen from the dead uh, even at the cost of their lives. So, I mean, the, the claims of Christianity are extremely bold. They're very daring. And uh, the it, it hinges upon, I think, if you're looking at it kind of logically, I think it hinges upon the resurrection. Mm. So anyway, I find that, I find that to be very um, compelling. The more I've kind of learned. And then to be honest, Jack, as well, like, now this isn't, I'm not making a, a claim that this is exclusive. You're going to meet really incredible people who are, uh, who are non-Catholic Christians. Mm -hmm. I, I know many of them and they're, they're wonderful. And then you're also going to meet wonderful people who are not Christian at all, who are non-believers or who are Buddhists or uh, who are uh, Hindus or Muslims uh, who are really extraordinary. But like my, uh, my experience of uh, Catholic Christians who are really living their faith is uh, profoundly compelling. Like I've met some extraordinary people. I'll just tell you about one, Jack, very quickly, because I, I don't want to be rambling on. But it's all right. A friend of mine, his name is uh, Matty Hart. So, are you familiar with Mickey Hart, the former manager for the Tyrone Senior uh, Football Panel? Yes, yes. So, the, it's ten years ago this year that Michaela, his daughter. And my friend's sister, Maddie's sister, was murdered on her honeymoon in Mauritius. And um, like, I've, I've heard Maddie tell this story a number of times, but just the journey that they went on, basically uh, dealing with the the murder of their sister, of his sister, and the uh, the injustice of her killers never being brought to uh, to account, never being brought to justice. And I remember him saying. Uh, very clearly that uh, because of uh, his faith, because of his belief in Jesus Christ and what Christ taught about mercy and forgiving and loving your enemies, mm -hmm. he was confronted with this, like uh, his faith challenged him to forgive the men who murdered his sister. Mm -hmm. And since that time, since 10 years ago, every single day, he prays for these two men and they know who they are. They, he prays for these two men every single day, uh, and he prays that one day that they will be in heaven, and mm. that they will be that he will be with them in heaven. Mm. Um, and his ability to to forgive and to uh, pray for those men, I find incredible. Mm. I find it incredible. I find it heroic. Mm. Um, and I suppose it's witnesses like that of real Christianity uh, that. Uh, give me great encouragement in my faith. Mm. I look at them and I say, that's what I want to be like. That's the real deal. Mm. Mm. I suppose, uh, good or bad, the perhaps Catholicism as of late is uh, seems unique in its uh, perhaps more flexible. It seems to perhaps move with the times a little bit more. You know, I mean, everything from gay burns, crusades back in the day to, you know, the more things like gay marriage and all those kind of things the the other religions seem to have quietly been more staunch in their view. What What's it been like? as a priest during those times, I, 
you know, as things have kind of shifted and as perhaps Catholicism has tried to evolve or move with the teachings? Hmm. Um, well, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I mean, like there are some teachings that are just, that are uh, eternal and that we don't like, and it's not that, again, it's not that we made them up mm. or that someone, we, we had a vote once, you know, and kind of came up with this, this sort of stuff. But, you know, we, uh, we, I suppose maybe the, the way that the teachings are presented has been, uh, has evolved and needs to evolve uh, even more. I, I'm a big fan of the um, idea that, like, um, that, the, the truth doesn't need to be compelled, shouldn't be compelled, but it should be proposed. Mm. So not, or, I beg your pardon, the, the dichotomy is typically framed as the, like the, the teaching, the gospel is proposed, not imposed. So I think that that's a really healthy way to, to go about doing it. But like, there are eternal truths. Like, so for example, like, you know, we believe that marriage is between a man and a woman, let's say, you know, and that it's uh, for life, that it's eternal. Um, and that it's a sacrament, like it's been raised to the point that it is a, uh, it reflects something of the nature of God himself. Mm. Um, and it is a source of grace. In other words, like a source of God's like help and his, uh, kind of, uh, his sanctification. It, it makes the, the people who are involved in it holy. Mm. Um, so we do like with those things, we continue to believe, uh, we just, I think we want to always respect other people, even if they disagree mm. with those tenants um, or are living in a way that is like, that's obviously not, that's divergent from that. Um, like we still love, we love those people, you know, and like we want, those people are a part of our communities. They're a part of our families. They're part of the church. Mm. So we, you know, we have to, we, we love each other, you know, mm -hmm. even though like, all of us are imperfect. And I suppose Catholicism is a big, um, it's a big and very uh, diverse tent mm -hmm. uh, as well. Maybe just to say that too. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I don't know if that's, if that goes, if mm -hmm. that's helpful at all to, to say, but you know, there are eternal truths, but I think that the way that they're presented in a way that's not doctrinaire, but rather in a way that shows their beauty or goodness or the reason why we believe certain things mm. is kind of uh, is helpful so mm. that we propose it and not impose it. Yeah, I know uh, my granny, uh, God rest her soul, the, uh, one of the things that she often struggled with was she was born and she grew up with this idea that you could never touch the sacrament, that that, was not, uh, that wasn't, wasn't allowed, it was a holy thing. And then obviously towards the 60s or 70s, that, that changed. And that was a difficult yeah. testing moment. So those, I think, mm. are some of the things that, you know, the less hot topic, I suppose, that challenge people on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, that's true, Jack. Absolutely. And I've heard other people say that when they were growing up, like in your grand, in our grandparents, mm. uh, it, like era, like it was a sin to eat fish on a Friday mm. um, throughout the year. And so like all of a sudden, you know, that changed. The church sort of said like, okay, that discipline we're setting it aside. Mm. And people found that very disorientating. People found it a little bit, uh, you know, how could something be seriously wrong mm. one year and the next year it's not seriously mm -hmm. wrong. So it was, uh, I, I, and I suspect that it probably wasn't presented uh, maybe terribly well or explained, mm. but like we have a difference, like we would distinguish, if you look at it um, like a little bit more carefully, there's a difference between uh, what we call in Catholicism doctrine and discipline. Hmm. So in other words, doctrine is sort of the unchanging eternal truths uh, and discipline is something that is malleable. You know, it's, it's, there's a flexibility there. Hmm. Um, and so, yeah, fish on Fridays is an example of hmm. discipline or as you said as well, like the receiving Holy communion in your hand. Hmm. That's right. Exactly. You know, hmm. that's something that is, is a discipline. It's, it's not something that's found in scripture or, uh, which is essential and unchanging. Mm. Uh, it's something that it can be adapted. Mm. Um, so, something yeah, of it, but it's something of the later years, of course, was the idea of sex before marriage was completely not a thing. You know, it was a very, it was very much a sin, and all of that. 
that teaching or at least that doctrine seems to have quietened down a little bit. Does the church still regard having sex with somebody before marriage as a sin? Yes, it does. And the you're right about it being quiet and <laughs> being quieted down. And I think that, you know, in some ways I, there's, I think there's a variety of reasons for that. Like we're in some ways reacting against a previous era's um, very hard and heavy handed uh, treatment of human sexuality. Mm. And there's like a, uh, we're very, we don't want to be perceived as being like, uh, I don't know, like repressive mm. and, you know, those, those sorts of things. So I think that there's, you'll very rarely will you find a priest or any sort of like uh, figure, official figure within Catholicism who's like, who bangs on about this happily, mm. <laughs> you know, it just isn't, mm. it isn't something that we talk about kind of with the, uh, uh, like very obsessively or whatever. Mm. But that said, um, no, it is, it is absolutely, it is the case. And it's, you know, the reason why it, it is that way is not senseless. Uh, it's because sexuality is a tremendous gift from God mm. that can be uh, abused. And it's quite like, it's a powerful force that needs boundaries. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, if the Me Too movement has shown anything, it's that that is the case, mm. you know, like it's, it's a powerful uh, part of the human experience, but there's really important boundaries that need to be set up in order to ensure that people's dignity isn't tr like trodden on and, and like hurt. Mm. And more than that, it's like, so it's not only like the, the Me Too movement would be, you know, the, the sort of modern conception of sexuality would be consent would be the essential kind of uh, moral, I think, standard. Mm. I think that's fair to say mm. consent between two adults, but like for, for a believer, like sex is more than just, you know, a, an activity that can be deeply meaningful or trivial or a bit of entertainment mm. for us. Sex is a gift from God, which is profoundly tied into uh, procreation uh, in fact, where you can't kind of separate it. Uh, and then also like, it's a reflection of the very inner life of God himself, the Trinity. That's why we say that sex is a, or that marriage is a sacrament. It, a sacrament is a, a kind of a, a visible sign of an invisible reality and it reflects something of, of God. So marriage reflects that. And so, you know, the, the reason why kind of sexuality is, has those safeguards, the, the sort of sense behind it is that like it, it's something holy and beautiful mm. and powerful mm. and it needs to be, it has a proper place and we need to mind that. Mm. So anyway, that's the reason behind it. Yeah. Towards the future of the next few months, I think things are reopening and, you know, uh, the pubs are filled, outdoor pubs are filled right now. How do you see the church moving forward? It was fair to say you might have had a kind of a bleaker outlook on just the general future of the church five or six months ago. Has that maintained or is there perhaps some room to grow there? Yeah, I think we're, uh, we're, it'll be interesting to see what happens. If you look globally, uh, you'll see that as countries, uh, as the vaccination numbers go up, mm. that uh, society begins to open up and approach, dare we say it's normalcy, <laughs> what things used to be like. Mm. So, I mean, if you look at the United Kingdom, if you look at the United States, uh, you can see that, you know, a lot of the things that they're, they're just further down that path than we are. So I would certainly hope that, you know, as those vaccination numbers go up, as the percentage of the population increases, that we'll start to see a, you know, more people being able to gather, uh, especially for mass, obviously, but even for other things, too. We want to see the country open up in a safe mm. way, but like we want to see it open up mm. Mm. Uh, and then. Um, you know, other things as well, like, I mean, they've, the, the CDC in the United States and many states have now, like, uh, removed their uh, mask mandates. Mm. So, like, very often people in the United States aren't wearing masks now, you know, in public or, or 
uh, even in indoors. So, you know, those are good signs. Mm. I, I really hope that we follow suit in a safe way, of course, not irresponsibly, but that you know, we start to get back to uh, society starts to open back up again. I think it'd be great. Mm, mm. And of course, you will be able to see Father Shane in, uh, well, in one uh, church near you, which is Castle Park Church. You're there most of the time, I assume. And as this thing starts to reopen more, there'll be more masses and more people and things will look a lot better, I'm sure. Yeah, please. Mm. I hope so. I hope so. I, yeah, I think everybody in a lot of different sectors probably hopes that too. But yeah, I certainly, mm. Mm. I hope that I'd, I'd love to see more people being able to come back and people to be come back kind of confidently too, Jack, you know, people were very mm. afraid mm. and people are still a little bit nervous. Mm. So, you know, I look forward to people kind of finding their confidence again mm. and, you know, kind of coming back to mass particularly, but even just coming to the things that they love to do. Mm. Well, the great father, Shane, thanks so much for your time. It's always a pleasure.